Apartheid, a system of institutionalized racial segregation, persisted in South Africa for decades, influencing the country's social, economic, and political landscape. Apartheid was enacted through a series of laws that divided the population based on race, categorizing people into different groups and assigning different rights, privileges, and resources to each. The discriminatory laws were in effect from 1948 to the 1990s, when the apartheid system was officially dismantled. Despite the legal repeal of apartheid, its consequences persisted, creating long-term challenges and disparities in South African society. Apartheid's legacies can still be seen in the persistent barriers that divide South Africans based on race. For many people, skin color has a significant impact on their quality of life, employment opportunities, and income levels. Racial segregation has had a long-lasting impact on South African cities, perpetuating spatial and socioeconomic disparities. While the formal end of apartheid was a significant milestone, the long-standing issues it left behind require ongoing efforts to address and correct, highlighting the complexities of dismantling systemic discrimination and fostering true societal integration. That story begins in the early 1800s, when the British built a network of railroads that transformed the region's economy, excluding the vast majority of black people, and then made that exclusion illegal. To understand why there is still segregation in South Africa years after apartheid ended, it is necessary to first understand the roots of apartheid before examining a contemporary example of this segregation. Watch till the end to get these shocking facts. Apartheid was a system of institutionalized racial oppression that lasted from 1948 until the early 1990s in South Africa and Southwest Africa. Apartheid was defined by an authoritarian political culture built on Boscap, a system of bossed ship, which ensured that South Africa's minority white population ruled the country politically, socially, and economically. According to this system, whites had the highest social status, followed by Indians and coloreds, and finally Africans. Apartheid's economic and social consequences are still evident today. Apartheid was classified into two types. PD apartheid, which involved the segregation of public facilities and social gatherings, and grand apartheid, which imposed racial barriers to housing and employment opportunities. The Prohibition of Mixed Marriages Act of 1949 was the first apartheid law, followed by the Immorality Amendment Act of 1950, which made it illegal for most South African citizens to marry or have sexual relations with people of different races. Under the Population Registration Act of 1950, all South Africans were divided into four racial groups based on appearance, known ancestry, social standing, and cultural similarity. Black, white, colored, and Indian, the latter two of which had multiple subcategories. Where people lived was determined by their racial classification. Between 1960 and 1983, Apartheid legislation forced 3.5 million black Africans out of their homes and into segregated neighborhoods, resulting in some of the largest mass evictions in history. The majority of these targeted removals were intended to confine black people to 10 designated tribal homelands, also known as Bantistans, four of which became nominally autonomous governments. As people became assimilated into the Bantistans, the government declared that they would lose their South African citizenship. Apartheid sparked widespread international and internal opposition, resulting in some of the 20th century's most influential global social movements. Finally, it was widely condemned by the United Nations, resulting in a broad arms and trade embargo against South Africa. Internal anti-apartheid resistance became more militant in the 1970s and 1980s, resulting in ruthless crackdowns by the National Party administration and protracted sectarian warfare that killed or imprisoned thousands. Some apartheid improvements were implemented, such as giving Indian and colored people political representation in parliament, but most activist groups were dissatisfied with these measures. Apartheid in South Africa ended with Nelson Mandela's election victory in 1994. Apartheid was a pervasive, racially-based segregation system that forced South Africa's different races to almost completely separate. During the apartheid system, South Africans were divided into four races, white, black, colored, and Indian slash Asian, with approximately 80% classified as black, 9% as white, 
9% as colored, and 2% as Indian slash Asian. During apartheid, whites wielded nearly all political power in South Africa, with other races effectively excluded from the political process. While the end of apartheid granted all South Africans equal rights regardless of race, the country is still dealing with the societal disparities that decades of segregation had created. Despite rising GDP, poverty, unemployment, income disparities, life expectancy, and land ownership have all declined as the population grew. With the end of apartheid, South Africa has become socioeconomically stratified based on race. Following that, government initiatives have attempted to address unfairness with varying degrees of success. South Africa's unemployment rate is extremely high. In 2004, the overall unemployment rate was 26%. Redistribution aims to transfer commercial farms owned by white South Africans to black South Africans. Restitution is the process of compensating whites for land lost as a result of apartheid, racism, and prejudice. Land tenure reform seeks to enhance the security of access to land. Several pieces of legislation have been passed to promote land reform, restitution, and redistribution. The Provision of Certain Land for Settlement Act of 1996 identifies land for settlement purposes and offers financial assistance to those who wish to purchase it. The Reparation of Land Rights Act of 1994 established guidelines and legal backing for restitution. The Extension of Security of Tenure Act of 1996 helps rural communities gain stronger land rights and governs the relationships between landowners and the people who live on them. These land reform strategies have proven to be ineffective so far. The Land Redistribution Program provided land to over 250 000 black South Africans by 1998. There have been very few restitution claims settled. Despite the African National Congress's target of 30% land reform, barely 1% of land changed hands in the five years after the programs were implemented. While only 4% of the wealthiest people are functionally illiterate, indicating a significant literacy gap between income quartiles, the Reconstruction and Development Program was a socioeconomic initiative aimed at reducing racial inequities by promoting business and education. Apartheid's geographical segregation continues to have an impact on educational opportunities. Good schools, which are usually found in affluent neighborhoods, are out of reach for black and low-income students. While more South Africans are pursuing higher education, there remains a significant racial divide among these students. Currently, 58.5% of whites and 51% of Indians attend college, compared to 14.3% of color and 12% of blacks. Despite having one of the largest education budgets on the African continent, South Africa finished last out of 140 nations in the Global Competitiveness Study for the Quality of Math and Science Education and 146 for the Quality of General Education in 2013. According to the same survey, the most significant barrier to doing business is a lack of education among the workforce. As a result, education remains one of the poorest performing areas in post-apartheid South Africa, as well as a major contributor to persistent inequality and poverty. Today, it doesn't take long for the penny to drop once I leave or Tambo International Airport. Again, Johannesburg is the unfortunate result of capitalist greed and 20th century prejudice. Nearly 150 years later, this massive metropolis remains haunted by the sins of its founding. Johannesburg, like Cape Town, Durban, Port Elizabeth, and other South African cities, is distinctly and painfully divided. These cities are still divided. The wealthy of Johannesburg continue to live in the opulent northern suburbs, where some restaurants serve michelin starred cuisine and property prices are exorbitant. These places are still predominantly white, but this is gradually changing. The employees work in Soweto, Alexandra, and other impoverished, crime-ridden black neighborhoods. Johannesburg has always been divided, and it remains so 28 years after apartheid ended and 32 years after Nelson Mandela was released from prison. This economic behemoth serves as both Africa's dream and nightmare city. The roughly 6 million residents come from all over South Africa, as well as Bavaria, Manchuria, Malawi, and Bangladesh. The city continues to attract those looking for a better life. 
It is the world's only large city that was not built on the coast or along the banks of a major river. This is because it is a gold child and not a trade child. When gold was discovered in 1884, it was just a patchwork of farms, but it quickly grew into a chaotic, violent conglomeration of settlements that drew white explorers. Gold diggers both literally and figuratively sex workers, settlers, criminals, sheesters, black laborers and elites from all over the world, all looking to make a fortune. It evolved into a frontier town and flourished in a colonial manner, with white mining owners building mansions that stretched into opulent northern suburbs, while black people were driven to the south into townships. Apartheid formalized a flexible colonial system in the 1940s by establishing Soweto, a black labor reserve, and expelling black residents from the city while requiring them to carry a passbook or permit at all times to prove their right to be there. This was the architecture of Apartheid Johannesburg for 46 years, from its formal establishment in 1948 to its dissolution in 1994. Black and white, rich and poor, segregated and unequal. Then there was 1994 when, as previously stated, Mandela and the African National Congress were inaugurated as presidents. There were high expectations for a new South Africa in Johannesburg, one that was integrated, non-racial, and free of historical divisions. Spatial apartheid would be eliminated through innovative and determined urban design. It does not exclude the possibility of change. According to a series of maps released by the government statistician in 2016, Johannesburg is the most integrated of the country's six major metropolises. That picture, while encouraging, is also troubling. The Johannesburg Central Business Area has a high proportion of black African residents, but white flight to the northern suburbs has occurred over the last two decades. Despite efforts like bus rapid transit to make it easier for Sauda residents to commute to work in previously white neighborhoods, Johannesburg's townships such as Sawido remain largely isolated from business districts and traditionally white suburbs. Even more encouraging is Johannesburg's decision in February to implement a first-of-its-kind inclusionary housing policy, requiring private developers to make 30% of all future residential constructions affordable, regardless of location. It has the potential to be a game-changer for the city if implemented correctly. However, Johannesburg's fortunes are inextricably linked to those of South Africa, which has endured a difficult decade under the leadership of deposed former President Jacob Zuma. The country is now led by Cyril Ramaphosa, a former trade unionist and businessman who is combating corruption that thrived under Zuma. Tensions are rising, and many believe South Africa is on the verge of collapse. Now, consider a current example. Take the beachside community of Strand in Cape Town and the township of Numsano in Cape Town. These two neighborhoods are only a few meters apart, but they are clearly separated by a narrow strip. The people on each side leave very different lives. Strand has very nice houses, great driveways and backyards, while Namsamo is much more crowded and the people in Namsamo have fewer basic services. 92.9% of the people in Strand have piped water as compared to Namsamo's 48.8%. 58% of Strand has internet access, while Namsamo is at 23.9%. It's not surprising, too, that 83% of Strand's residents are whites, while 92% of Namsamo are blacks. The Strand-Namsamo divide is just one example. There are several such divides across South Africa, even in 2022. In South Africa, on African soil, the color of your skin determines where you live, where you work, and your quality of life. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like, and also don't forget to hit that subscribe button, so as not to miss out on any of our upcoming videos. Thanks for watching, and see you in the next one.